All right, everyone, uh, I think we're good to start. Uh, so hello and welcome again. Um, I am Jaya Jain. I'm one of the conveners of the Rethinking Economics India Network. And uh, welcome to the second day of the Rethinking Economics India Network Annual Event 2021, Dialogues on Economic Realities. We're all super thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining. Um, the Rethinking Economics India Network is a part of the national network of the is part is is the national network of the global rethinking economics movement. Um, we started last year in June 2020 and uh, have aimed to since then create a space and promote pluralist alternate and new economic thinking in India. Our event, the dialogues on economic realities, marks the culmination of delivering numerous focused deliberations and projects within the domain of pluralist, new, and alternate economics in India and to a certain extent in the global south. Um, we are aiming to bring together a consortium of voices from local and international think tanks, youth-led uh, organizations, academicians, activists, um, and all key stakeholders to ponder and brainstorm on ideas and solutions for reshaping uh, our understanding and implementation of economic policies and theories. This event, which is spread over the two weekends of uh, 24, 25, 26 September and 1, 2, 3 October, uh, is uh, covering four main themes, diversity and decolonizing economics, uh, better economics for climate change and biodiversity, global governance and the global south, and curriculum reform in economics. Today, we are gathered here uh, to, uh, to talk about understanding the shifting barriers of access to higher education in India. This session is part of our today's theme on diversity and decolonizing economics. Just before this, we had a session on decolonizing development with Surbhi Kesar, Yirga Gilo Voldeyes, and Stephanie Blankenberg, where we talked about um, decolonizing development studies and the hegemony of, uh, of, the, of the development policies and theories that are currently in the hegemony of Eurocentric approaches in development studies. In this session, um, we will be aiming to understand what are the, what, uh, how, what are the consequences of marginalization in higher educational institutions uh, and uh, what will it take to enable diversity in the presentation in higher education in India. Um, but before that, before we start with the session, which we would have with Professor Tirumal, who is a senior faculty member with the University of Hyderabad, who we have here with us, um, who we would be having the uh, AMA with. Before that, we would also like to talk about the work that we have been doing as a network um, for the past year within this year. Uh, we had previously published a report on diversity and representation in economics, and we have with us here Mihir Parikh, who is our research lead on this report and has been working on it um, for the entirety of the, uh, with us for the entirety of the past year. And he would be giving us a brief interim update on the previous report and on the continuation of the work that we have undertaken afterwards. So um, Mihir, uh, to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jaya. I'm just going to quickly share my screen so everybody can see my presentation. Uh, yeah, I should be able to. Oh, uh, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry. I think you should be able to do it now. Okay. Uh, Is my screen visible? Just coming up. Yeah. Yeah, is this fine? Okay, great. Okay, uh, thank you, Jaya. Um, the Diversity Project is an initiative of REIN um, to ask and answer a fundamental question um, in the Indian economic, uh, Indian education policy space, uh, whether educational institutions are truly inclusive. Um, well, in this context, we explore caste and gender-based diversity within the higher educational institutions in India with a particular examination of the economics ecosystem. So at, up till now, um, in, well, in, in this context, so since we explore caste and gender-based diversity within the higher educational institutions in India, um, we are working for the first six months of our project in 2020. Uh, our team worked relentlessly on studying the existing literature uh, and data on how well represented women and members of the SC, ST, and OBC communities are in the academic space for economics in India. 
Uh, this effort culminated in our first report being published in January 2021 uh, in a partnership with Mank Prayogshala and Bahujan economists, which, um, which essentially came to a, a good amount of findings that we were able to um, well, essentially culminate into this one slide that you can see. Some of the more salient findings of our report were, uh, one, 28.5% of, of faculty members across India uh, were women. Um, so 22.7 were at the professor level, 32.5% were at the associate professor level, and 32.2% are at the assistant professor level. Um, only 29% of the authors presented at the Indian uh, Statistical Institute conference from 2004 to 2017 are women. There was no improvement over these numbers uh, in, in the years that were studied. Uh, schedule cast students in higher education constitute about 19.9% .9 of enrolled students, which doubled since 2005 and 2006. Uh, however, concurrently, schedule cast, uh, schedule tribe students were up by 8%. Uh, from uh, Joshi and Malgan, uh, there was a study conducted of the Indian Institute of Management um, across India. And out of the 512 faculty members, uh, two were scheduled castes, 13 were uh, other backward castes, and none were from the ST category. Um, only nine OBC professors were teaching in central universities across India uh, against the 313 quota posts as of Jan 2020, according to the All India Secondary Higher Education um, Survey from 2019. Um, out of 19 sample institutions, only six did not report a single uh, faculty member from the ST community, according to the MHRD. And finally, out of the 706 vacancies advertised by 11 central universities, only 2.5% were for, from the scheduled castes and none were from the scheduled tribes. Now, for this, uh, not, not only did our study result in these findings, uh, but they also resulted in identifying some of the existing gaps in the literature uh, and the data that was on caste and gender-based representation in the Indian education, system, uh, education space. Uh, we found that there was a lack of complete data and literature on caste-based diversity in higher education faculty bodies. Uh, we found that there was a lack of comprehensive studies that report on the representation of marginalized communities in a diverse sample of universities across India. Uh, there is a lack of centralized, segregated, empirical data on the number of faculty from different sections of society. And finally, there is a significant lack of literature in the Indian education context on how implicit attitudes and bi biases form barriers in higher educational institutions. So to better understand the state of representation in this context, um, our project is now in, in its second phase where the above gap in the literature is bridged through our methodological approach, which focuses on the gender and caste-based representation of faculty members in the economics departments of Indian universities. Uh, similar to the first report in this phase, we focus on women and members of the SC, ST, and OBC communities. So first, we collect primary data by deploying quantitative surveys and filing RTIs against the 21 central, public, and private universities of the sample. Uh, these, you know, these surveys allow us to gauge the number of faculty um, members in each of the aforementioned categories. Uh, second, through qualitative surveys, we capture how attitudes held by faculty members and the university system as a whole may drive biases um, against marginalized communities, hence creating barriers to access in higher educational institutions. Uh, our methodology allows us to better inform educational policy in not only improving access to higher education, but also we believe that our research has external validity in that our findings uh, can be extrapolated to other dimensions in this context, thereby making education in India far more diverse and inclusive. So currently our team has sent out RTIs and we've received positive responses from universities. Uh, we have also received certification from the Collaborative Institutional Training Initiative Program, uh, which allows us to appeal for IRB approval for our qualitative work from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. So up till now, this is the work that we have been doing. We hope that in the coming few months, we'll be able to um, obtain our ethics approval on our work and uh, disseminate our surveys further and um, continue our work uh, in the coming months and hopefully publish soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahir. Um, so this was a brief uh, update uh, for everyone on the work that we have been doing. Um, we welcome, of course, any and every feedback that uh, you would have on one, if there's anything more that we could do uh, to if you want to also help us help us out with this work, uh, we uh, more than welcome volunteers to join us. Um, but so then now, but uh, without further ado, we would move to our AMA with uh, Professor Tarumal. So as I had mentioned today, uh, we are going to be talking about understanding the shifting barriers of access to higher education in India. 
Um, this session seeks to eliminate and question discrimination via exclusion in higher education in India, addressing the consequences of marginalization by highlighting and discussing the possible methods, policies, and pathways that enable diversity in representation within such institutions. And with that, we have Professor Thirumal here with us, who is a senior faculty member with the University of Hyderabad. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. Um, I would like to start uh, this session by asking you, um, what are the barriers for marginalized communities to access higher education in India, both students and faculty? Uh, and how do institutions- not even be Sorry, um, we would request everyone to be on mute, sorry. Um, and a follow-up question to that is how do institutions of higher education act as places of exclusion, especially along caste and gender lines? Long time the number you have to Uh yes, Professor, I think we have I think there was some problem with uh people being on mute. Um but yes, I think we have resolved this. Sorry. Thank you, Jaya. Uh, and also Mehir for that uh, uh, detailed uh, report on the uh, statistics of marginalization and also uh, some suggestions about qualitative work that uh, you plan to do in the near future. Uh, well, um, I would like to uh, uh, start off, uh, not exactly addressing your question, but I'll be addressing as I go along. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, my work has been uh, in trying to understand uh, what I would call as a certain conservatism or uh, a certain kind of uh, status quo uh, attitude of higher education in India. Um, uh, for want of a better word, uh, let me label this conservatism or uh, status quoism as Brahmanism. Uh, I'll be making a survey of critiques that uh, has come up to question this form of conservatism or Brahmanism. Uh, I find there are three kinds of critiques to this conservatism. Uh, one of them is my kind, but there are two others which are uh, very powerful critiques in themselves, and I would like to uh, speak of them. The, 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 these three critiques are, one is um, a lack of uh, diversity. I mean, that is representation and so on. That's one of the important things. Um, uh, the second one, uh, which is more epistemic in character and uh, which uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Gopal Guru has called it as uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, condescending attitude towards empirical work in the social sciences and uh, the division of labor that happens between theoretical const construction and empirical work. Uh, where uh, he coined it famously as a theoretical Brahmin and the empirical Shudra, uh, the, the kind of uh, 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 the division of labor that, uh, that is uh, unconsciously, uh, you know, uh, 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 is present in the practice of social science in the country. Uh, the third one is my kind of work. Uh, that is uh, the violence of Brahmanic embodiment in higher education institutions. Um, uh, this is with uh, this is with regard to the the life of caste in higher education institutions and how there is a lived reality of caste in higher education institutions by the idea that the lived reality of caste in higher education. I simply mean that. Uh, Cast exist in a palpable sense, and uh, thereby there is uh, caste violence and there is caste discrimination, and uh, that has been my kind of work. Uh, now, these are the this is this would be my structure of presentation, but I will not uh, uh, I will not go in this order. 
Uh, what I'll do in, uh, in the first few minutes is to look at uh, the class of institution that I would like to work with. Uh, um, I'm going to uh, uh, identify uh, only certain institutions. Uh, uh, these institutions for me uh, uh, would be central universities, IITs, IMs, um, uh, 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 ICERs of late, um, another exclusive uh, social science research institutes, and also in natural science, I, and also uh, would be I, ISC and um, PIFR and so on. I mean, this is a class of institutions that I'm interested in. Um, so that is, uh, I would like to know how, what is the life of caste in these institutions, in these elite institutions? And what's the form of discrimination that happens in these institutions? Uh, not that I've done any uh, ethnographic work, but uh, uh, I, uh, I've been a part of a university system for a long time and, uh, uh, and uh, I have a certain a lived sense of caste as it were working in the institute and also learning from other friends and, and uh, the, uh, the kinds of discrimination stories that we come across in terms of suicide, in terms of a certain kind of violences over the last uh, 10, 15 years. So uh, we tend to make sense of it in a particular way, right? So that's my uh, understanding of, uh, it's not that I have done any ethnographic work. Uh, now you, uh, you title the lecture as shifting barriers to access. Uh, but I would also want to include success. Uh, it is not merely access that I'm interested uh, of students, uh, you know, joining, uh, SCST students joining the institution, but also what is, how, what is the rate of success and why success doesn't happen? That is equally important for me. Uh, <clears throat> that is also, I would think, uh, changes economic reality. That is also to an extent, um, holds uh, a certain economic consequence, I would want to believe, uh, material consequence. Now, uh, I have been a teacher uh, for more than 30 years in a university setting. I joined the university system in the early 1990s. And at that juncture, the public universities were discreetly opening up to the neoliberal experiment. Uh, it was not yet a full-blown experiment. Today, as we enter in the third decade of the second millennium, we are witness to a scaled up neoliberal experiment in higher education by which we are, we are saying that practices relating to the basic structure of the university system, like the subsidized fee structure, reservation policy, admission procedures, uh, faculty recruitment, promotional avenues, including pension scheme, uh, have all changed dramatically in the public university system. This also is about reservation and so on. Um, uh, now, if you look at the institu institutional uh, organization of uh, higher education, you'll find that uh, even the main funding body, University Grants Commission, is gradually being replaced by a body known as Higher Education Funding Agency, HIFA. Uh, which provides funding based on uh, the resources that the university can generate, that the uh, institutions can generate. Uh, it's a new thing for Indian public in universities because we were only supposed to disseminate knowledge and not generate correspondence, corresponding uh, uh, monetary, uh, 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 <clears throat> what do you call value? Uh, this is the first time we have been forced to generate resources on our own. So there's a new structure as it were. I do not understand the details of the economic governance of higher education. I'm more of a cultural theory, so I'm not an economist. Uh, except to say that social justice is no more a governing norm of higher education. So uh, you, you would think that, you know, the higher education was subsidized for a long time and uh, one point which you have to note is the first 30 
years or maybe even 40 years of higher education system in our country, the state subsidized education and this subsidy was fully utilized by upper caste, middle class uh, citizenry. Just when the Mandal Commission report comes, just when the newer bodies enter into this university system and these higher education, you suddenly see there is a revamping of these policies. So for the first 30, 40 years, there is all kinds of subsidies and absolutely no accountability. Uh, uh, economic accountability is there, but when just when new bodies are coming, new people are entering this, the marginalized are entering this, all the structure changes. Uh, now, this is when I began my career, that is the liberalization just about to start. And of course, it was not, it is, uh, it did not start full blown. It, it has taken some time though. But what has been its career before that? The first 30, 40 years, what is the historical setting of these university system? Now, I have been a beneficiary of higher education and uh, uh, how did the system work? How inclusive was the system? How inclusive was the Nehruvian higher educational system? If you want to understand that question, then <clears throat> I would like to see some continuity between the Nehruvian socialist policy guiding higher education institutions and the present demand for diversity. So I would want to believe that the Nehruvian state was absolutely non-inclusivist. It is not that we have to go, I mean, uh, shout at, uh, I mean, uh, uh, at this point, oh, people are being thrown off, no. They never entered the space. So, uh, <clears throat> so diversity was not the norm for the Nehruvian state institutions, educational institutions, exclusive elite institution that I mentioned, the class of institutions. In other words, was there an idea of diversity tied to the making of higher education institutions from the beginning of the post-independent period? Absolutely not. The class of institution that I mentioned, uh, central universities, IITs, IIM, TIFR, ISC, have been fully funded from the central government, but they have remained very exclusive till date. From recruitment of teachers to enrollment of students, they have remained very upper caste in composition. This cultural elite have somehow managed to be unaccountable to constitutionally mandated affirmative policy in recruiting students are teachers from marginalized sections. I would also want to believe that even the composition of the administrative managerial staff in these institutions have been upper caste. At least the bureaucracy could have been from very different sections because they don't require any specialists. But even that I would think have been very upper caste. Having said that, what it means to have a non exclusive policy for the first four decades of these elite institutions? What has been their inherited tradition that we are borrowing? What is the inherited tradition? What is the cultural psychology of these institutions? Rajiv Bhargava writes, I mean, he's, he's trying to define Brahmanism. It's not a very complex definition, but it's an interesting definition. He says, Brahmanism is a more perfect form of conservatism, a status quoist ideology par excellence entirely suitable to elites who wish to perpetuate the social status 
power and privilege. Now, if we logically extend this argument, then what it means is that the elite higher educational institutions are also centers of conservatism where social status, power and privilege of the cultural elites are reinforced and perpetuated. Right? <clears throat> now, there has been a critique of, of this conservatism from uh, different uh, traditions of scholarship, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will try to uh, retrieve some strands of this, uh, uh, this, this kind of a critique. One is, of course, uh, those of you who are aware of Gopal Guru's work. Uh, now, Gopal Guru's work, you know, the, the conservatism could be in the idea of knowledge production. The conservatism could be in the idea of knowledge dissemination, what you're talking about access. The conservatism could be in the way you even think this knowledge is superior to this knowledge. So Brahminism is very nuanced. I mean, you, there's so many ways in which that, in which this, uh, this uh, status quo is reinforced. And a certain supermacy is argued for. I would want to use conservatism for the kind of label that sometimes used by uh, middle class, upper caste elite, what they call as the merit. That merit has a conservative overload, right? Now, for Gopal Guru, Indian social science represents a harmful divide between the theoretical Brahmin and the empirical Shudra. So there are certain people who do only one class of work that labor, that intellectual labor itself. First of all, you enter the intellectual space, you don't allow. Secondly, when you enter the intellectual, oh, this is not the kind of work that is valuable. That, that kind of work can be done by anybody. The theory, abstraction, it requires far more intellectual robustness, intellectual depth, a cultural inheritance. So you make them feel that they're not capable of this kind of work and you place value on a certain kind of work. And Gopal Guru has problems with that kind of, that. it's a sort of conservatism. He is he's critiquing that kind of a problem of uh, within the social science discipline. So it is in, in, the, in the realm of knowledge production, in the, in the way we value knowledge in the way Brahmanism has a way of saying, oh, this is more important, just like how certain manual labor and other kinds of labor are being seen. So within the field of, he uh, he is tracing out. Now, uh, if you look at uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Sharmila Rege and uh, Uma Chakravati, Gail Onward, now they, they are trying to sensitize the disciplines, the disciplines conservatism, to or open up the disciplines conservatism to the questions of caste and gender. They, they are opening it up to caste and gender. And I don't know how many of you have heard the uh, work of Abba Sur. Now Abba Sur is a science philosopher. Uh, uh, she, uh, she works on discrimination within scientific, in science laboratories. And she has looked at how caste and gender work in the institutional space of this very elite place called the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Uh, how, how it works. So in, in different ways, these people have said, look in the knowledge production, how people have divided the work, how they value one kind of work, make people who do the other kind of work as not worthy 
of first of all that work is not worthy because it belongs to certain kind of people so caste and gender has been studied in that way uh, uh, for people who have done english studies you know the work of suzy taru and others they have examined english studies with feminist studies and and see how english studies and feminist how how feminist studies took on english studies and said you have to address me in some ways you know and how a lot of feminist work has gone into english studies now a good a good portion of uh, ma and english literature anywhere has feminist scholarship right and that's because some of these people scholars have taken that up and opened it up in a certain way right so that is one kind of a critique that has come up uh, more in the epistemological production knowledge production more in the way we value gopal guru's problem has not really been in knowledge production he says there should be a thick in theorizing suppose you want to talk about dalit and you do not want to go to the dharadi and 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 live there and eat there and whatever but in a fancy whichever place you want to sit and work and uh, you know write some uh, interesting uh, 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 what do you call theory about it i mean it, you you do not experience what they experience how how do you how do you even there is no ethics of theorizing you need there should be ethics to i mean theory, theory is not just theory you need ethics to the, uh, uh, they should be ethically uh, responsible for it okay now uh, so this is one kind of uh, uh, work that uh, that i uh, that uh, uh, that i want to bring to your notice uh the second kind which is of mine and uh, i've been trying to illustrate how this conservatism or brahmanism gets encoded in higher institutional structures what are its specific embodied manifestations let us call this critique as foregrounding the visceral visceral is the body rather than the cerebral and how the visceral expresses how the body expresses caste not ideas expressing caste i'm not interested in ideology i'm interested in the vitality of caste in the existence of caste public institutions constitution should adhere to secular ideology but the embodied functioning of these institutions seem to display brahmanism of a certain variety in some ways i am arguing that the everyday normalized brutalities that upper caste bodies inflict on dalit bahujans goes beyond the calculable intentions to hurt humiliate or insult the dalit bahujans so what i'm trying to suggest is when a upper caste teacher and a dalit student are interacting it is not the intention of the upper caste teacher to insult humiliate or whatever but the bodily engagement of this teacher with that student very unconsciously is scripted in a way that it shows lack of respect it shows some kind of contempt it shows some kind of disdain as it were a disinclination towards that person there is you are a thinking subject but your thinking itself is disinclined to think for the other right so this normalized brutality is not something that is done consciously like pile thadvi is a very conscious act i'm not interested in that i am interested in everyday brutalities which goes unnoticed if caste lives thrives every day in these institutions it tries to these normalized way this is a normalized upper caste normalized brutality that i am trying to examine <clears throat> i am suggesting that spectacular instances of dalit bahujans committing suicides in these elite spaces are extreme examples but day to day experiences of normalized brutalities are generally not registered because they become naturalized or normalized 
you don't question it. It's it's very much like gender. You you don't you don't see it. I mean, you don't you don't question it. Now, what it means? It means two things in 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 uh, in a in a philosophical sense. It means two things. It means one is there is a potential to experience an undiminished being for a pakas. There's a potential to experience an undiminished being for upper caste. What it means is the upper caste can experience life in its fullest. Not only the actual can be realized, but also the possible can be realized. Okay. To, to answer this question, I'm going to briefly focus on the social and historical formation of these elite institutions and cast in them for a while. We have to confess that the Brahmin was the forerunner among the Savarnas in creating these centers of excellence. More importantly, the Brahmin had to practice caste and in the same breath claim to be modern. I'm both traditional. When you when somebody says I'm both traditional and I'm I'm also modern, what you mean is I ca I can be very casteist and also I can be modern liberal. So this happy cohabitation of modernity with tradition uh, is something that calls for examination, right? Uh, let us call this as. That is cohabitation of the modern with the tradition, of caste with the modern, of reason with tradition, as what uh, as an embodied sattvic modernity. I'm using the word sattvic modernity, but I'm also suffixing it with prefixing the sattvic with embodied sattvic modernity. Now, caste had to, to be a sattvic, you need to practice your dharma. Caste had to, in that sense, caste had to exist in a lived sense. How, how does, caste is not living somewhere in the villages. I mean, you have to live here, man. I have to eat the kind of food. There are certain ways of preparing the food. There are certain ways of using the ladle, you can't use a ladle for what you're using for curd and put the same thing with some other dish. My goodness, you can create a ruckus in the house. I mean, these are antiquates. And where do you practice? It could be practiced inside your house. And where's your house inside IIT Bombay? So, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not, <clears throat> I, would, I would go off the record for that, but, but it, could, it, could, it could mean anything like that, right? Uh, so, uh, thus, caste had to exist in a lived sense and it had to ensure and affirm Brahmin being on a daily basis in these elite higher education institutions. In a way, these exclusive paces of teaching, learning and research facilitated the Brahmin to gather his sacral, material and cultural possessions. Sacral, which is sacred, he has to be sacred. Material, and cultural possessions, including his sensorial and aesthetic dispositions, and hold them in the most desirable, desirable way possible. This gathering, one may call as the Brahmin being, I would call it the Brahmin Sattvic Brahmin being, the Brahmin being. That is, you have to be Brahmin in its richest sense possible, in its fullest sense possible, but being very modern at the same time, right? Uh, the dwelling for this Brahmin being had to be crafted outside and inside of the sovereign nation. This necessitated the transformation of the physical space of these newly established institutions into Brahmanically inhabitable places. Now mind you, what I'm saying is very important. We understand these as public institutions. We are not 
we are not supposed to understand this as brahmanically inhabitable institutions. Nehruvian state and later on for the first 30 years or 40 years gave them so much leeway that the character of public institution has gone and the character of brahmanically inhabitable places has taken over. Embodied existence demands participation of the senses and therefore transforms spaces of learning, allow the senses to be delighted rather than corrupted, ignited rather than doused, and instinctual life is mediated through a Brahmanic sense and aesthetic. Um, what is it that I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say, Gopal Guru was bothered about the nature of knowledge production, the ethics of knowledge production. Now the ethics of art of living as it were, what you eat, cellular production, intellectual production, social production also has a certain way. And what is that certain way? That certain way is to experience um, life inside, an, inside a public institution as a life that, uh, that can be obtained within an agrahara. Uh, a public institution of education institution is not just meant for intellectual reproduction. Here we are talking about even the senses have to be groomed. The senses have to be groomed means what? The senses have to be groomed means if that could be there could be teachers who as true Brahmins if they have to see a colleague who is not a Brahmin, who is who belongs to Dalit or somebody in the morning, early morning he comes and he sees a Dalit colleague on the on the on the corridor, poor chap, his day is over. It's such a it's such a problem for him. I mean, he has to go back home or, or do some kind of a stuff and uh, get rid of that, right? Now he has to be a Brahmin in one breath. And he has to be a teacher at one breath and also see this horrible sight. How can he navigate this? Yeah. And this, so the senses, how do you keep this away? For the first 40 years, don't bring them inside the corridors. You just show them away. So I don't get disturbed. My eyes don't see something which which will you know, knock me off. The entire day I'm not able to do work, either with the students or with, the, or with my colleagues. So I'm moving away from an intellectual understanding of higher education, from a philosophical understanding of higher education, to more a sensorial understanding of higher education. And this is, Mind you, this is not done consciously. This, this happens at the level of senses, even before it is processed by the mind. Right? Uh, so I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to say the cultural psychology of higher education institutions, what it was in the Nehruvian period. Uh, it's a, it's some kind of a hunt. This is how it should have been because there's nobody else there, right? Now I'll come to, uh, which also means that they can have an undiminished being. They can have a fuller being, a fuller existence. That's what it means, right? Not to have others. That's what it means. Now, the second one I will talk about, uh, and sorry if I'm going to offend any of my 
young uh, colleagues here. Uh, this is about uh, the aesthetic and corporeal existence of upper caste students and potential upper caste aspirants for IITs and so on. Okay. Now, the creativity of the Brahmanic disposition has enabled even student bodies in one of the IITs to found the institution of the Society for the Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture amongst youth. What is music got to do with IITs? But why only this kind of music? Completely removed in some ways from popular culture or whatever. Now we all know it's elite musical content, circulation, consumption. Its fundamental orientation is to put off any logical revolt against caste. Uh, I, I'm just giving you how not only the teachers, but also the students participate in the sensorial life of the campus. The, from music to food to various things, you know, how they inhabit these places, right? Uh, I am also, in one of the articles, I'm also uh, bringing an anecdote. And this anecdote is about uh, how the feeling of the Brahmanical history of higher education institutions it passed on to generations of Savarna middle-class homes. In the mid eighties, the itinerary of post-independent India's Brahmin middle-class family pilgrimages to South India included not only if they come to Chennai, included not only the temples of Kanjipura elsewhere, but also visit to IIT Chennai. I mean, you go to the temple, but why you, why you come to the Chennai? I mean, why, why you come to IIT Madras? How in one breath you occupy both IIT Chennai, you're showing your children who are aspirants for IITs. You have come to Chennai and you're taking them to the temple at Meena at uh, Kanjipuram. And in the same breath, you take them to IIT Chennai. It is important to note that the secular institution, which is IIT Chennai, becomes part of a pilgrimage and granted a similar same erratic power, aura of the temple. Finally, this is for the aspirants, and, but finally the social and cultural power of the graduates are perpetuated not merely through swanky, acquiring swanky jobs, but also finding their partners through IIT and IAMshadi.com. how the cerebral and the visceral come together. Uh, and forms, and forms bonding, and also forms bonds of exclusion. It's both, both, both this and that. Now, actually, uh, having set this up, my, we come to what Jaya was asking me, shifting barriers to Dalit Bhojan students and faculty. From the question of representation to embodied freedom, that's, that is a shift I would think. So the question of representation was very important uh, in, the, in the 90s following Mandal Commission. Uh, but if you were talking about the Rohit movement, we are talking about an embodied freedom. It is not just a spatial and logical inclusion. It's, it's more to do with an embodied uh, freedom. Now, uh, prior to 1990s, most of the elite HEIs, that is higher education children, neither had marginalized students or teachers. From the 90s, we see some presence of the students on elite campus in central universities, IITs, and other exclusive centers of excellence. Um, in my understanding, the cultural practices of the Brahmin, rather than any philosophical mori, undergird the logic of these institutions. Let us call this the community rulemaking mechanism. This rulemaking is never fixed and rigid, 
but inscribed within the folds of the skin of these institutions. It is about a certain Brahmanic disposition and less about transparency rules or principles. Now, what I'm trying to say, say is, although these are public institutions, the way they were run, I won't want to name, there is an art institution in our country, an excellent, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of great prominence, uh, a center of learning of great, it's a national prominence, I won't want to name it, it's a public institution, but you will find fathers following sons, sons following daughters. Families have inherited that institution. There have been teachers, there have been research scholars, and <coughs> it has been run like a typical hereditary agrahara. So the rule making, although you have constitution, you have these rules, but nothing works. This is uh, why nothing works, because it, it, they, they, the sense of that institution for the community which is residing there, is very different. It is not a Viberian impersonal bureaucracy that is there. No. It is a very embodied, idealistic home, a home away from home. It, it's, a, it, it's an extended home as it were. So this is related to what I have called as a force associated with dominant bodies that govern elite HEIs. The force of the dominant body uh, that I have worked on in one of the articles, it's a non-discursive context for the practice of caste and consequently of discrimination also. Uh, the habitus of elite higher education encompass an orientation towards both perception and practice an orientation that is suggestive of caste practice. When we say that this is a Brahmin institution, what we mean is that it is not merely an object of thought. When you say university, we think it's an object of thought. It's, an, it's a scientific institution. It is a knowledge institution. No, it is not just an object of thought, but of practices, imperceptible practices, to whose effects on the Dalits that, that, that practices which are related to caste, those imperceptible practices which are related to caste, effects on the Dalit Bhaujan's moral, psychic, social and spiritual health can be devastating. This Brahmanic disposition, this Brahmanic embodiment can be devastating. In such a cultural imagination, Dalit Bhaujan's are things that lack the capacity to shine and their constituency of matter that is devoid of immanent power and vitality. You know, what is it? It's a, it's a very big statement. What I'm saying is, if Brahmin is a thing, if Savarna is a thing that has inherent power, inherent vitality to shine, that thing has power to shine on its own. So the Dalit Bhojans are things that does not have the capacity to shine on their own. They're inert things. They don't have vitality. They don't have imminent power. This is the unconscious, everyday unconscious of higher educational institutions. I'm interested in studying that unconscious, which guides the everyday institutions. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tarumal. Uh, this this was amazing. Some I, I have made a lot of notes, uh, and I think everybody in the audience has also got some very pertinent food for thought. Uh, I just have one uh, follow-up question. Uh, but before that, uh, we have actually gotten a couple of requests from the audience. Um, 
asking if you could uh, if there's a way in which you could tell us or tell us the resources that you've been citing one specific ask for example from jyotika has been could you let us know about who is the person who is working on cast in iisc for example and we have gotten a couple of other requests awesome. so there are some yeah yeah, so if, yeah. if you could uh, uh, send us a yeah sure uh, aba sur her name is aba sur a b h a s u r all right okay so that has been noted and uh, i think we could also be in contact with you post the session if you could just send us some of the links of uh, the texts that you have mentioned and we could give it to our audience after the session uh, i think a lot yes. of them are interested um so we yes. would follow up with you on that but i just have one follow up question um i wanted to talk a little bit i wanted to understand a little bit about the solutioning part of the problem where because this is a problem that has been in existence for a long time but right now we see that a lot of people are talking about or have, this problem is gaining traction and that you know there is a problem of exclusion uh, and there needs to be done something about it so what according to you would be say the key priority is going forward for higher education institutions to solve this problem what would be some of the policies that could be put in place because um a lot of policies even might exist on paper and this is something for example that we have been able to find out through our to our research from our report that you know there is a grievance redressal mechanism in a lot of universities but it doesn't really work so what are some of the real policies uh, that need to be put in place to resolve this problem of exclusion and to make these marginalized communities feel like you said not only have access to education but also succeed after having gotten their access to education um actually uh i just saw a circular uh, my colleague also is here uh, uh, dr shri devi and she only sent me the circular uh which says uh, teachers upper caste teachers have to be extremely sensitive to the marginalized students and uh, uh, and they recognize that discrimination is quite rampant in all the institutions of excellence so this is the first time uh, where uh, the, the the government is accepting that there is caste discrimination going on in these institutions caste doesn't live there it lives in the villages you know remote villages which we don't know of so uh, so there is a certain uh, a punitive uh, measures that are coming through and also recognition that the problem exists um but i have a feeling uh, uh it calls for a certain uh what do you call uh, uh, a self examination a critical examination of the cultural elite and uh, uh, if there is no generosity if there is no uh, way that uh, uh, they are going to uh, allow themselves to be critically examined and uh, uh, recognize that uh, there is some issue here uh, because these are very educated people i mean highly educated people and uh, so uh, they it is not uh, going to uh, uh, i mean if we have to go a long way i think the thing should be not just unity but a lot of persuasion and a lot of uh, uh, hard labor on uh, uh, from both uh, sides you know uh, uh, from the sides of uh, the cultural elite and also from the government and um, and some kind of a movement for understanding that's what the rohit movement was the rohit movement was about uh, uh talking about uh, this very uh because we are not saying that they're consciously trying to humiliate or insult no it, but the fact is you it's not easy to let go of caste but if you practice caste you're going to practice discrimination so uh it's it's a tough job i there are no quick uh, solutions for this and uh, it's uh, 
policies on their own will not be useful. Uh, there should be a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, some kind of a movement, some kind of, uh, uh, I would want to believe uh, rethinking economics is not merely uh, you know, organizing talks, but it was also part of some kind of a larger movement. Uh, it, 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 it is in that sense uh, that we, should, we need to think of. But I don't have uh, ready-made solutions for this. Thank you, Professor. And yes, we are also at our end trying to understand uh, uh, what could be, first, before going to the solution, trying to understand what are the problems that are faced by the professors and by the faculty within the institutions itself, which is a part of our report. Um, and what are the, some, some of the implicit biases, for example, they face uh, as, as a part of their education or as a part of their teaching uh, to understand that even though some policies exist on paper, even though some circulars are being circulated, um, there's still this major problem that exists and what needs to be done about the same. Uh, so I think with that, uh, we are coming towards the end of the session. Um, but before that, uh, thank you so much with, yeah. for engaging with us. Uh, this was, uh, this was highly insightful and, uh, we have received, we've already received some wonderful feedback from the audience. Um, I think we got a very, very good, uh, insight into what is the origin of the problem and to which extent the problem still exists. Um, and uh, we would definitely be following up with you um, to understand what are the resources and texts that you have cited to also pass it on to our audience. Uh, and uh, I think we would also love to be in touch with you with respect to our report. Um, uh, what you have said and the points that you have raised could be very, very helpful for us to, uh, like you said, to, be to become a part of the solution and to be able to frame the solution for these problems. Um, so thank you so much, Professor Turumul, for engaging with us. If you would have any closing remarks, please feel free. Uh, thank you. Keep up your good work. Thank you. Um, for the audience, thank you so much for uh, engaging with us today. This session was a part of our annual event, as I had mentioned in the beginning. Uh, today we're focusing on diversity in decolonizing economics and uh, the next session which will start at 5 30 pm is about revisiting tribal agency uh, and we are going to engage with uh, G. Amarjeet Sharma from who is a professor uh, at JNU and with Rajni Soren who is an activist and lawyer um, with the Human Rights Law Network uh, and they would be talking about uh, revisiting uh, some of the tribal agencies and institutions and policies that have been in place with India. So please do join us. Uh, links have been dropped already in the chat. And uh, again, thank you so much. And of course, thank you so much, Professor Tarmul. Thank you. 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 Thank you.